my honor and my privilege to introduce Dr. Michael Driscoll, who's going to be moderating our event tonight. He likes everything short and crisp, so you can see his bio written on the paper, and I think it's only like three lines. So let me add a few, two more lines onto that. His love of data started as he worked as a software engineer for a human genome project. And he's very passionate about data visualization. And he's very excited that Edward Tufte commented on his blog. So, got to ooze here. <laughs> so please join me welcoming Michael Driscoll. Uh, thanks, Aiko, and, and I, I will say that actually the reason why Edward Tufte commented on my blog is because I emailed him and asked him to comment on my blog. <laughs> <laughs> so it shows what you can get when you ask for it. Um, I think it was a Sunday morning, he had, he had a lot of free time on his hands. Um, so uh, first I just want to thank uh, the organizers. I think this uh, naturally is a great topic, uh, ev evidenced by the, the great turnout that we have here. Uh, and the panelists for uh, giving some time to us tonight. I know every, all, all of you are very busy folks. Um, so I, I want to talk about three things in, in introducing predictive analytics. The first is I want to sort of talk a little bit about some of the forces, I think, that are behind why we suddenly have this surge in data. Um, then I want to talk a bit about what predictive analytics is and why I think it can be a, a balm uh, to help soothe some of the pains that occur when we have big data. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a few of the uh, themes that, that we'll address in the panel. So um, to start, it's been widely quipped that information is the oil of the 21st century. I think this really gets to the, the notion that we're moving from this industrial age uh, where the primary driver of economic activity was energy, often in the form of hydrocarbons, to an age where information is the driver of economic activity. I think that uh, the great thing about information is that it's a renewable resource. It's abundant. Uh, and if I think we look at the panelists tonight and around in this audience, we can think of many of ourselves as being the wildcatters of the information age. So what's, uh, what forces are driving this, this rise in data? Well, I like to call it the attack of the exponentials. Um, when you show a slide like this to uh, investors, they usually like if these curves, uh, the, these you know, bottom three here in the corner are uh, your cost curves, and the one in the upper right <laughs> is uh, you know, Quora, Quora, new Quora members in the last you know, 24 hours. <laughs> um, but in this case, actually, these curves refer to uh, something a little different. Um, they reflect the exponential decrease in cost of storage, CPU, and bandwidth. Uh, and the upper right there uh, is an exponential increase in, in the access and ubiquity of, of networking. And it's really kind of shocking when you think about it that in 1980, the cost of a terabyte of storage was $14 million. Uh, that was an Apple drive. Um, and today, and this is actually, or last year, so this is probably out of date already, um, it was $70 for a terabyte of storage. Uh, the implications of this are huge. Um, for one, it becomes worthwhile to store almost everything because you can store it cheaply, you can afford to move it, and you can compute over it. The result is an explosion of data. This is what I, I like to call the, the data singularity. Um, the real singularity may never come, but the data singularity, I think, um, we're living in its midst. So this is a challenge, and, and uh, it's also an opportunity. When, when everything can be stored and, and kept around, I think our lives start to feel a little bit like a movie. Um, and we've seen this movie before, The Matrix. <laughs> and increasingly, we live in this instrumented planet. Um, we've got all of these sensors in our pockets, cell phones, and, and many of our devices that are pulsing with data into the cloud. The result is really the emergence of a digital nervous system that strings the earth. But you can't have a nervous system without a brain. 
And that's really where predictive analytics can help. All of this data certainly has to be good for something. So the promise of predictive analytics is to do something with this data. Uh, and many of the panelists we have here tonight are doing something with their data. Um, in a nutshell, the way that I would describe predictive analytics is a process of uh, taking unrefined data, extracting features from it, uh, learning a model uh, about those features, and finally making some predictions. And maybe by way of a story, I'll, I'll tell um, briefly something that I, I did for a client uh, a couple of years ago, where we took billions of call records from cell phones, um, and we built uh, a high-frequency call graph of who people called each other. So that would be this, these features that we extracted from that data. From that, we learned a model that described what were the most likely drivers of someone to cancel their cell phone contract. And based on that model, we found that if you talk to someone for more than one minute in a given month, uh, and they cancel their contract in May, that you are 600% uh, more likely to cancel your contract in April. That was our predictive model um, for North American Telecom. Uh, so that's just one example of the types of predictions that can be made. Uh, that's not the only example. Uh, many of you tonight probably took advantage of predictive analytics on the way down <coughs> by predicting traffic on US 101. Uh, I spent some time in that uh, on the way here. Um, we also have seen predictive analytics in recommendation engines. Many of you have heard about the Netflix prize, which was a million dollar prize awarded to a group of, a big group of individuals that were able to better predict favorite movies or ratings on movies. And that really does move the needle. Netflix knows that giving better predictions means you rent movies you like, which means you spend more money with Netflix. Um, there's other places where predictive analytics is playing a part. On the web, predicting clicks. We know that AdSense uh, and, and many of the display ads that we see are actually being predicted, sometimes even in real time, to find the, the most likely ads that we'll click on or, or follow through with. It's been said that uh, Visa and MasterCard probably couldn't stay in business for more than a few weeks if they ever turned off their predictive analytics for fraud detection. And if you've ever traveled a lot over a few days, uh, you've gotten that phone call from Amex that says, you know, you just spent $600 in Vail, but you were somewhere else, you know, six hours ago. That's saving them money, and there's real dollars and cents there. And even into more frivolous things such as Major League Baseball. I think all of us have seen uh, or read or heard of Billy Bean's Moneyball, uh, Michael Lewis's book about the Oakland A's. And it's actually true that since 2007, PitchFX, a, company, a, a software program developed by Sports Vision, has been tracking millions of pitches thrown in Major League Baseball, their velocity, their location, their displacement patterns. And this is just a, a hint, I think, of the kinds of data that we'll see uh, playing a, a role in the sports sports worlds. So, great, public data about pitching is, is one thing, but there's there are some concerns, and this leads into the themes that we'll talk about tonight. Information about where uh, Cole Hamels threw his pitches, you know, two years ago, not a big deal if all of us know about that, but what about if people know about our healthcare data? Well, what if people know where I'm standing right now and how long I was taking to drive on US 101 and where I stopped? This is the question of data privacy and ownership. So I think the Wall Street Journal pretty much broke the topic pretty uh, harshly, and probably some of our panelists here will have a few things to say about uh, the limits of privacy, whether we need self-regulation. I think it's a consequence in, of, of an age of big data that uh, all of this will probably influence the way we think about privacy. It's often been said that we may go from the end of um, thinking about restricting access to data to restricting its use, like we do in, on Wall Street. So this, this large scale of data, we have billions of cell phones. This brings up another theme that we'll talk about tonight, which is scaling algorithms. When you have a lot of data, the approaches you take to that data are necessarily different than when you have small data. And I know that uh, Scott at Yahoo deals with data mining at scale. Google deals with data mining at scale. It's been said by Pierre Norvig that more data beats better algorithms. That's sort of become a mantra, but it's not always true. Even if we have these algorithms and the ability to scale them, we hope they're doing something for us. And that drives the third theme that we'll talk about, which is user data and analytics. 
how can we use all of this data and the models that we learn at scale to actually make a better user experience? So there's a story that, that's told about uh, Facebook's data science team in 2006 looking at what types of things drove folks to stay on Facebook, to engage with the product. And they found that the biggest driver of whether you stayed and engaged on Facebook was how many friends you have. And that was the genesis for their aggressive suggestion of friends uh, very soon after someone signs up. This is a graphic that was developed by a, a Facebook intern showing, uh, I guess, friendship requests around the world. And then finally, the fourth theme that we'll bring up tonight is the limits of sharing this data. Right, just as the Wall Street Journal article talked about you know, the many trackers that are installed on our cell phones, it also talked about some of the leakage of personal data that was going to different third-party providers. Tim O'Reilly has said that the internet is a data operating system. And I think the questions uh, are about what types of firms and, and products can we build on top of this data operating system? What, si what types of data exchanges and ecosystems will we see emerge? Um, and again, our panelists tonight have a few things to say about this. Uh, Trulia is one of the companies that Teresa is involved with. And Trulia is essentially an ecosystem of real estate data. Um, uh, Blue Kai, which uh, Omar is involved with, and I'm, he'll talk a bit about in a, in a second, uh, is an exchange of, of audience data. And my own company, MetaMarkets, also does a lot of analysis of uh, online advertising data as well. So those are the four themes. And with that, I guess I'll turn it over to uh, our first speaker. Great. So uh, Omar uh, uh, T T Tawakal is the CEO and founder of Blue Kai. Um, and I'll say a few more words about you maybe when we bring you up for the, for the panel. Great. Thanks. I have to say, it's rare when I'm sitting and, uh, and waiting, but I actually prefer to hear you than, than to get up. That was, that was a very nice presentation setting up uh, what this whole ecosystem is. My name is Omar Tawakol, and uh, I'm the CEO of Blue Kai. What I'm going to talk to you today about is the, the digital data economy. I'll talk a little bit about who Blue Kai is and what we do, but uh, some perspectives on what we think this digital data economy is. Before I start, I, I'm really honored to be here. I went to school here, graduate school, and an undergraduate at MIT, so when I got a call from a group called the MIT Stanford Venture Lab, I, I, I pretty much had to participate in anything they asked. So I was, was just so honored. Um, so the first thing that we like to think about before we start talking about data, we, we think about how marketers and companies using data have been thinking for the last 30 years. And they've been addicted to this concept of proxies. So think about the companies that send out mail to a zip code, um, you know, physical mail to, to your zip code. Y you know, my next door neighbor is an 82-year-old woman. She does not behave anything like me, I hope. And, uh, and so, so the targeting there is not that good. If you look at a TV station, I sit in the room with my daughters and watch a TV show. And you know, we're very different. If you look at what was happening in the web for the first few years, it was all about the context of the page. And these proxies are fairly poor in determining anything about who you should market to. So proxies don't buy your products. Then Google and Yahoo come along with search and really flip the entire model. And they basically say, wait a minute, why don't you advertise to people who are looking for your product now? You don't have to guess or be that predictive or much of a genius if someone types Jeep in the 94024 area code, what ad you should show them. So it turned out that it flipped the whole model to say, why don't we advertise and market directly to people and not work on the proxies? There's a multi-billion dollar data industry selling people on how good their proxies are, and there's a new way to look at the world, which is go directly to the people. So when we think about the sources of these data, you have people shopping, you have people searching, you have people tweeting, you have people you know, checking in, these are very direct indicators of the human intent to buy a product. And this is what I think is driving a lot of the attention towards what you can do with data going after people. So a, a good example of this, you're reading an article on a content site. So remember the first few years of the web, there's a lot of content. If you look at the last five years, there's this explosion of blogs and social media and video where it's just not that clear what ad to show. Like on this page, Obama was going to, to, to Hawaii for vacation. Does that mean you're in market for a trip to Hawaii? Probably not. So what ad do you show on this page? Well, what if 
a few minutes earlier, you had just been at Expedia, and you had looked for a trip to Hawaii. You had configured it exactly. Most people don't sit there wasting their time at Expedia um, saying they're going to Hawaii when they're not. You have, you, you have very good indication of commercial intent. It becomes very clear that a hotel or airline company should be showing an ad on that content page, so you're targeting the user. And if you look at, you know, there are folks here from Yahoo, they can tell you what is the lift. If you had sold an, a, an ad on, a, on an email page, it might have been, you know, sub one dollar. If you sold a targeted ad to someone looking for a car on that email page, it may have been five or six dollars. The entire lift of four dollars or five dollars, the majority of the value comes from the data, and that's what people are waking up to. Actually, data is king. The first few years of online, context was king, and what we're finding is, in the vast majority of your time spent online, it's actually the data that's the king. Problem is, who owns the data? Very tricky, very tricky set of questions that come out here. If you look at the offline world, uh, you walk into a store and you use a credit card and you buy a product. There are three parties there, the credit card company, the retailer, and you. Who owns the data? I don't know. The credit card company uses it. Sometimes those credit card transactions go into an, anonym, uh, an animal, anonymized transaction pool. And now Axiom or Abacus or those companies get access to, to the data. The retailer uses the data for themselves. The consumer uses the data. Have we solved the question of who owns the data? Not really. So if you look at the online world, here, every interaction we have has at least three explicit parties. The consumer, the, the publisher who's, who's interacting with the consumer, and the advertising advertiser who is paying to sponsor that page. And there's, I always get asked the question, question, who owns the data? And I don't usually have a clear answer. Rather, what I look at and say is, what rights do you have? I'm not going to have a debate with you of who owns it. You have it, I have it. If we're sitting in this room and says, who has ownership of the memory in Omar's brain? That's kind of ridiculous. Like, of course I remember that I saw you. Does that mean uh, I have rights to it that you don't? It's just a very difficult philosophical question. What is easier is, what legal rights do you have to use the data and transfer it under what circumstances? And that's the issue that we as a company um, look at and solving. And so what we as a company did, and we came into the world and said, data is in many cases more valuable than the media that it runs on. So why don't we build a marketplace where people can input data and take out money? And in that marketplace, let's solve some basic problems. What are the privacy rules? So let's set them up contractually. What are the usage rules? When you get this data, what can you do with it? For how long can you use it? Can you transfer it or not? How do you price it? It's an incredibly interesting question. Because data is a non-rival good. I could have it, you could have it, somebody else can have it. It doesn't diminish in value if, if a couple of people have it. It diminishes value if everybody has it. So how do you price things like that? So that's the goal of the marketplace, is to provide common, common taxonomies and pricing mechanisms and rules on privacy so that people can plug in data one side and pull out money on the other side. As we built up this marketplace, we ended up finding most of the big commerce players plug data uh, into Blue Kai. Most of the big ad networks, the portals, the publishers, the agencies, and the trading desks started getting seats on our exchange, and we started to see lots and lots of liquidity and activity. Then we started getting approached by the data companies that were offline data companies who would come in and were able to online their data. So they started getting seats in our exchange. So people like Axiom and Nielsen and Polk and Lodemy who does social data. And so we started becoming a hub of data where people would put it in on one side and the buyers would come in and get a seat on an exchange and buy it. We do not sell, sell ads. Um, we don't have an ad server, we don't have an ad sales force. The next thing that started to happen is people started saying, that's interesting, I don't want to sell data. I want to use my own with all your same technical capabilities. I want a private marketplace so I can do one-on-one -on -one transactions with a partner where I'm not selling them the data but I'm allowing to use it for a limited purpose and that started proliferating. So th that's what we do, data management, acquisition. So manage your own data, acquire new data, and analyze. Uh, this is the last Blue Kai slide. Everything else will be about the ecosystem. So just talking about our experience, uh, what happened, we started in Q1 2008 and got the team together, just kind of the personal stories that were interesting there. One of my co-founders on the business side would sit with me when we had no customers, no buyers, no software written, um, and no sellers. And he'd look at me, and, and he listed the top seven commerce companies. He'd go, it would be great if we had this guy and that guy, and he started listing it. And I looked at him, I thought he was crazy. Seven months later, we had landed everyone he, 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 he mentioned because it was such an interesting concept to these big commerce data publishers that someone thought their data was very, very valuable. So we started growing and we, we hit 100 million uniques early on, uh, as you see those, those milestones there. 
a little bit later on, we had a transactional marketplace where people would come by one bit at a time. You go into a bid system, it kind of looks like AdSense or AdWords. You come in and say, I want Hawaii travelers, you bid a price, and when you win, we call you, you set your cookie, you now owe money. Instead of paying per click, you're paying uh, to set an anonymous cookie. So that was the model, and that was growing kind of um, uh, organically, and, and he came to me at one point and said, hey, why don't we s sell additional analytic value if people would, uh, would commit big dollars? So eventually we started hitting our first, you know, f first million dollar data buys, uh, which was a good, good milestone for us because it meant that there was some scalability uh, to the model. And we started growing, and then you see this point where there's this a little curve. We started to get some interesting channel conflict because we sell data not to the small advertiser. We sell the data to um, a network or an ad agency or a publisher who then package the data with an ad, and they sell it to the advertiser. So that's our model because these guys are experts in, in how to use the data. And then when big advertisers started coming to buy from us, we had channel conflicts where people would say, wait a minute, I just paid you a million dollars to buy your data. Now you're selling it directly to the advertiser. You're eating into my, my business. So we decided to mainly not do that, just pull back and, in, and, and take a blue kai, kind of an Intel inside strategy where we empowered our channel, all the big publishers and ad networks and agencies to sell, and, and we were just embedded in them. Um, and then I don't know how many people, how many people are in the ad industry here, just so I get, get a sense. So you, you know, you, you've heard of trading desks and DSPs. They started coming out, um, uh, you know, in you know, 2009, 2010, super interesting model. They were a piece of the agency world that was focused on exchanges and understood these models. Um, and so we started working with them and we, we started to see some uh, interesting evolution. And then finally, about six months ago, we launched this concept of private data platforms where you could use it and never transact with BlueKai, but use the data in your own way. And we started to see some of the world's largest marketers line up and start to do these things privately. So that just gives you a sense of, uh, uh, of, our, of our history as a company. That happens to be quarterly revenue that you see growing there, but I took out the numbers to protect the innocent. So um, let's talk a little bit more about the ecosystem. What ty types of data are interesting? So this is a funnel, it's a classic ad funnel. At the bottom of the funnel are people who are buying today. Uh, so someone who's like in market for a car, or flat panel TV, or, or for whatever your product is. The data at the bottom there is typically like retargeting or search or shopping experiences. That's what we tend to focus on. But if you ask any marketer out there what their most valuable banner advertising is, they're, they're going to tell you either search or retargeting. So that's, that's the bottom of the funnel. The next level up, you can't wait just for people to come in and say they want to buy your product to start advertising. Um, or you, you, know, you have to really convince people that they have to, if they want to buy a Mercedes, they have to pay up. So you have to convince them early on that it's worth paying up. So that's what branding is. So moving up the funnel, you start to look at people who have done past purchases. They own an Audi, and they're about to come six months out, off their lease. Maybe they'll switch to a Mercedes. And that's where you get the middle of the funnel. And then you, as you rise... Uh, up the funnel, you start predicting what Mercedes and Audis people look like based on their, um, their, their, their psychographics and so on. So that's the upper funnel. So what you'll find is a big range of data, and you'll find analytic companies who can take seeds at the bottom, like this person's about to buy Mercedes. He looks like these other million people. Why don't I give you these other million people? So you have entire companies, Quantcast, for example, who, who, who specialize in taking the seed um, and predicting and expanding the audience sense. There is also social expansion companies who come in and say, here are the seven friends of the Mercedes person. I won't give you their name, but why don't you serve an ad to the seven friends? Many techniques are there to take you uh, up the funnel through prediction. If you look at the whole area that's growing now, it's called data management for people who are doing, again, private use of the data. The first thing they do is they catch all their data in one place. They classify it very finely. And then they say, well, I can't just go after my people. I have to acquire third-party data sources. So they create audiences. And in the old way of doing media buying in the world, what you do is you call 50 publishers, and they sell you an ad package based on some RFP text. What's starting to change is marketers are taking control of that with their own data. They're creating their segments, and they're pushing it out to all the media partners, saying, please serve my ad to that cookie or that anonymous people. And so that act of reaching people is creating new data. How did it perform? How did my social spend, my video spend, my, my search spend, my banner spend? How did it do? What should I, what are my what-if scenarios on what I should spend? What audiences should I discover? And then you have this continual loop going through. So we often get asked, 
is it better to just chase your own current customers retargeting versus prospecting versus going after new customers? So what you see in this graph is, um, in this example here, this is a model of the car. We stripped the names again for the innocent, where they're just saying someone goes after, looks at a car on their site, and then they go on the internet and they show them that same car ad and they come back. You see the conversion rates are very large. In that example, it was, I think, 2.4% of the people who came and originally looked at the car and were shown an ad came back and did a conversion, like, you know, search for a dealer or request a quote or something like that. But what you'll notice is these other blue lines are people who weren't your current customers. They're prospects. There are people, b data that you bought from someone like a Blue Kai and targeted them, even though they've never been to your site to look at a car, they looked at competitive makes. So if you're Mercedes, it was Audi. If you're Lexus, it was Mercedes and so on. And so what's interesting about this graph is it shows you that though the red bar performed the highest, you can aggregate a lot of volume by getting external data if you add up all those conversions on the blue bars. There are even cases that we've seen in this other mar make of car that they did better going after people who hadn't seen their make. Um, and there were competitive makes, and that's called conquesting. So um, again, there's this big data about do, do debate about do you use your own data or external data. We don't really care. Use it all, right? You have to put in your, your own analytics and f figure out the economics. The next question that we get asked is, what's the time value of this data? See, a consumer who's looking for a trip to Hawaii is going to take that trip to Hawaii, and they're no longer in market the next day. If you're looking for a car, you're going to be in market for a few weeks. Once you buy the car, you're not going to be in market for a while. So the, there's a beauty to intent is, is, is that it has a time value to it. So what we did is we measured, this is a particular example. Every product has its own you know, decay curve on the time value of the data, but what you see is the data, it's very important to use that data very quickly, and it's very effective early on, and then it starts to taper off uh, over time. Now, of course, if you take this curve, you know, it looks like a ZIF distribution. Uh, it almost is. Uh, and so, it, obviously, it's useful to get the tail of the curve, but, um, uh, but it diminishes. What's an example of what this means? You could do um, retargeting and prospecting using audience data. So someone goes to your site and they look for a cell phone. Obviously, you should show them a cell phone ad over the next few days before they convert uh, to another carrier or another cell phone manufacturer. You could also, if you're one of these carriers, go out to an external data source and say, give me people looking for the competitive set. So if you're Verizon, I want to know people looking at I iPhones on AT&T and so on. And you develop a much bigger pool of audience. You then target them very specifically with the smartphone you think that they should buy, and you bring them to your site, and they, do, they, they become a customer. So that's the, the core case you see with audience targeting. There are actually many, many cases. You could use it in non-advertising cases. You could use it for site customization. You could use it for analytics. You can use it for offline CRM, very expansive cases. So the topic here is predictive analytics. As you know, we've been focusing on what we consider the fuel, the, the, the discussion about oil um, and information being similar, I, I really like. What we focused on is making sure whoever's analytics you're gonna use, you need good fuel. And so we're not gonna answer the debate, is it better algorithms or better data? We don't really care. Let's just make sure we get you better data because however good your algorithms are, they're gonna become better now. Um, and so what we look at is different types of analytics. In this example, we took a look at people who are, we're on four out of the top five commerce travel sites on the internet. And so uh, we get a ton of search queries for travel. And so we asked, what do people look like when they're in advanced bookers? Like what sets them apart? And so we, we take that query and we check it against all known data companies. So we ask Polk, you know, what are the people's buying habits for cars? Prism from Nielsen, you know, data logics, looking at their past purchases. We look at all the different shopping online behaviors and an and, and, and image came out that said, well, these people tend to buy flowers. They're, they tend to favor Verizon. Um, they like uh, digital cameras. Um, they tend to have a Mercedes um, in, or, 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 or a BMW in their garage. And they, own, they have home loans with a home loan value above $400,000. So you essentially let the data tell the truth. And we call these act-alikes, meaning you take any group of people and you ask the data what is most consistently known about them so a human can make a decision about what to do with that data. The second area that you find really interesting companies doing stuff in is what we call look-alikes, where it's not about a human deciding what to do with the data. It's about scoring everybody against a target. So BMW converters and then you score everybody else from you know, highest scoring to lowest scoring, so the advertiser can choose a cutoff and go advertise to those people. A whole bunch of companies doing that. 
We actually do that. We do lookalike scoring and, and actually sell scores in addition to selling data, but we also enable other really good companies to do their own scoring. So work with people like eBureau and Quantcast um, who do really good work and specialize in producing um, scores uh, on who, for you, who to go after. I mentioned social expansion. I think that's a super interesting area. Um, you, you know, Michael had mentioned before looking at call records. Uh, and, and so this is an emerging area where people will, will find ways to anonymously look at your friend lists and just say, because I looked at a BMW, Omar's friends may also be good targets for a BMW. It's a pretty interesting area. Um, so there are many, many different ways to do predictive uh, analytics. So just wrapping it up, what do I think are the trends that are most interesting? You know, we look, we run a data marketplace that has over 100 million uh, uh, transactions a day, meaning money is trading hands for people uh, in the auction system and then a whole set of private stuff going on. So what's, what are the trends that are emerging? First one, I think this is the year of the, what we call the data management platform. It's where big marketers decide, hey, I'm producing data and I'm leaking gold. So I'm doing business with people. I have 30 pixels on my site where the data is leaking to all these partners. I need to rein that in and classify my own data, understand how it's leaking and manage it more tightly and then go out and buy external data and do, do, do better marketing. So we see 2011 is the year where this is really gonna proliferate, and we think that by 2012, most CMOs in the country are gonna have this as one of their top three things they have to do. 2011, it's maybe the, the, the early half of the adopters. The next trend that we look at is that we think data is not going to be a type of advertising. Today you have search and social, and now you have audience targeting, and it's greater than a billion dollars as a bucket. Um, but I think of it differently. I think all advertising will switch to data-driven. You will have data feeds in your search. Social advertising is already data-driven. Mobile advertising is gonna start to use signals in, in terms of check-ins and, 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 and Twitter and other data. It's, it's just like the online channel. Um, and, and so I believe all advertising in the next few years will transform and you can, you can use data to either buy or analyze. The, sex, the second prediction, the third prediction I'd make is that Pixels are gonna go the, the way of the carrier pi pigeon. I don't know if you're aware of how this marketplace works, but if you go to a web page, there's probably anywhere from 15 to 30 pixels firing instantaneously to all sorts of parties so that they can do tracking. And those are sometimes serially calling another set of pixels. So one pixel can fire another five. Uh, and so it's just wild and it's slowing down the web pages and it's, it's causing kind of a wild west in who owns the data and what's it worth. And so you're gonna find technologies that say no more pixel, bring back control on what that data, uh, where that data is going um, and so that you can truly value and control uh, the data. And the last thing I'd say is people have been looking at data for direct response advertising, for them to create a sale instantly so they can value the use of the data and that's the early adopters in the field, I predict that very soon, at least half the budget for all the data companies that you see will be driven by brand advertisers in figuring out who they should brand to, not just the direct response, lower funnel uh, users of the data. So um, I'm really excited to be here as part of this discussion. I think the last thing I'd say that's interesting about data is if you look at the problem sets in the data space, the first one was let's build databases because applications all have to do their own custom stuff and it's too hairy and problematic. So there was this reign of 20 years of the, the, the database wars. And once we had all these databases, people started asking themselves, wait, I have all this data, how do I analyze it? So you had the analytics companies come up and you have SAS and Cognos and all these companies that give you a better way for you to understand what data you had. The unsolved problem was if I don't have the answer, how do I incent someone to give it to me? And that's where I think we're gonna see some really interesting advancements in the, in the area of data exchanges and data trading is the economic underpinnings of how I incent and pay and put rules on putting data in one side and getting dollars out the other. Thank you very much. Thanks, Omar, for that uh, great talk. And I think at this uh, point, I'm gonna call the panelists up uh, one by one and just say a, a, a brief uh, thing about, uh, about each. So I'll start actually with, with Omar. Um, as, as I said before, Omar is the CEO uh, and founder of Blue Kai, but another thing that many of you may not know uh, is that he uh, was born in Egypt and uh, he made some uh, news in the last week talking about the role of Twitter and communicating with some of his family back in Egypt. So that's your, your personal qu uh, quip that I, I'll bring you on up for that. 
<clears throat> Oops. Okay, he's thinking. And then next I'd like to call up Scott Burke. Uh, Scott is an SVP uh, at Yahoo, uh, focuses on user data and analytics. And uh, I guess, Scott, the only thing I can say is that um, I'm not giving you the user and data, uh, user data and analytics question tonight. So um, uh, hopefully you'll be able to handle the, the algorithms that scale stuff we throw at you. Thanks for coming up. <clears throat> Uh, Matt Barkoff is the Vice President uh, at Badgeville Media and Entertainment. Uh, Matt spoke with me earlier and told me he's a, uh, a big Patriots fan and uh, went on about how the Patriots are using sabermetrics like stuff. I'm a huge Patriots fan too, which is why... You're a Niners fan? Oh, well you're telling me how smart the Patriots are, so I, I agree with you. <laughs> um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll... Uh, Ask Matt to come, come up and take a spot. And, and finally, uh, uh, Tricia Renzetta is a partner at Excel Partners. And uh, she did not make a, a chat we had last week because she was on her way um, back from New York City where it's nine degrees, it was nine degrees Fahrenheit, um, which leads me to wonder why you're trying to start uh, an office in New York City, but. Because I used to be from Buffalo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great. So, uh, just to give everyone a sense of the format that we'll we'll go for here, um, I'm going to start out and ask a, f a few questions of our panelists that um, hopefully will surprise and uh, surprise them, and maybe their responses will amuse you. Um, I uh, on those four themes that we talked about. So. I really want to start then with, uh, and dive right in uh, with Teresia. Um, you uh, have been involved in a number of companies that, on the theme of privacy, some of your companies are involved in this, this securing of personal data, like Imperva, um, and yet other companies that you sit on the board of, like Glam Media, um, seem to be in the business, in some ways, of exploiting personal data to target, better target their users. So um, how do you reconcile um, you know, are you sort of is, is making money on both sides of the equation there at privacy, and how do you reconcile that? It's a beautiful business, isn't it? <laughs> at, least, at least you didn't accuse me of funding hackers in South Korea or North Korea, right? Not yet. Um, or Eastern Europe. Um, so I guess what I would say is a, a couple of things. So one is I, I separate out the notion of security versus privacy, and Omar may be surprised because I think this kind of makes us much more align on the privacy point. Um, that, than other people might think. So to me, my security investments, you know, security is the concept of there is a right and a wrong, there is a good and a bad, it's a, you know, there's a hard line. You know, uh, if you're a company and you have customer records in your database uh, that are people's credit cards, even before there was regulation, you probably didn't want anyone outside of your company to have access to it. In fact, you probably didn't want anybody inside your company to have access to it other than on a need-to-know basis. I am uh, crediting a return. I am reconciling some sort of mispriced transaction. So to me, security companies are dealing with sort of the black and white. Um, they also use a lot of uh, the techniques that a lot of the other people on this panel use with regard to sort of various different types of data analytics and data mining in order to ident identify either deterministic rules, i.e. predictive rules, or sometimes in network security, stochastic rules. But security is very different from privacy. To me, privacy is, um, there's not necessarily a black and white answer, and it's different for every person, or as Omar was saying, different perhaps on the use. And I think that, you know, we obviously also have a bunch of um, social media companies, which you didn't bring up, so obviously the, the privacy topic is very big in the social media world. And I think that what, what privacy is about is asking for explicit rights to use the information in very specific explicit ways. So each individual, it's, it's more the notion of choice, not the notion of black and white, it's the notion of Ask the user, tell the user what the information is that you want to use, what you want to use it for, and perhaps in some other context, if there's some financial gain, offer them the opportunity to be part of it. But there's no right and wrong. What Omar is comfortable sharing on his Facebook page or 
um, on his LinkedIn information is very different than what Scott might be happy um, sharing, or I, or certainly very different what I will share versus my you know, 12 teenage nieces and nephews. So I think there's no right and wrong on what <laughs> privacy is. And that's what makes privacy a much harder topic mm -hmm. to sort of regulate, if you will, or even to sort of moderate. It's really about giving users choice at very granular levels, my opinion. Um, when was the last time you were uh, asked about uh, cookies on your browser? Um, Let's see, in a board meeting setting or on a panel? <laughs> no, I'm saying, and yourself, you know, you're saying it's about right. you know, asking for rights. Yeah. When was the last time you sort of were asked okay. for the right of a, oh. of a well, third party provider? To so here's the problem. See, I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I have some companies who help with that. So I think, that, I think that's a fair point, right? So I think one of the things which um, I, have, I have concerns with is around things like that where there's not explicit, where it's not as obvious or explicit to the user how to. Um, make those choices. Mm -hmm. So even though there are a lot of sites that take a lot of heat or a lot of applications that take a lot of heat for um, their privacy rules or how, how complicated they are, it's really tough because if you either have complicated, very explicit opt-in, opt-outs mm -hmm. by specific features and functions, or you're right, then there's the browser where you, know, you really need to know where to look in order to clear cookies or not. Mm -hmm. um, I will say in defense of, you know, sort of, ad data, most ad data companies or ad networks or publishers that are, um, and I hope Omar's right that we get rid of cookies because and, and beacons because it does slow down page load time. I think that uh, most of that information is anonymized. So the reason why they haven't taken as much uh, heat or scrutiny from the federal authorities is because most of the information is used on an anonymized basis as opposed to uh, you know, social media information, which is much more personalized, mm -hmm. or more so, I know one of the things you had on there, mobile phone information, sure. which is um, incredibly um, personal. So I'm going to ask, uh, even though Omar asked to be excluded from the privacy, I'm going to do a follow-up with a quote from Omar. You, you, you said don't that. have to ask Omar permission. I don't think he <laughs> asked permission. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to ask. <laughs> he opts into everything. <laughs> There is no privacy policy here. Uh, so, Omar, <laughs> so uh, he opted into the panel, so that's a form of opt-in, I think. Uh, so, Omar, you, you said in, a, I think, a, a recent article that characterizing cookies as a form of spying is misleading. So could you just expand on that? Yeah, so the, the first thing I'd say is that the, the issue we have here is that we need sunlight as the disinfectant. So we came into the data world where all this data was collected about you, you didn't know anything about it. So what we've been trying to push is a world that we call bookend transparency, meaning any page that interacts with you, collects your data, should have a link at the bottom in simple English that lets you click on it. And then instead of a 17-page legalese CYA document called a privacy policy, it should just be a paragraph saying, we are collecting data. Here's how we're collecting it. Click here to see it. And then you'd see visually the actual data that's collected. So that would be one end. The other end would be the ad, where you put an icon, and it's starting to happen, the eye icon you're seeing out there. You'd click on that and see what's there. So that's the world we're trying to push, in, push to, was if, at the data collection point, at the end point. And then you let consumers make the choices. Now, do you really want to make a choice on every page you interact, interact with? Absolutely not. But you should be given that right. If you want to opt out completely, OK. You prefer to pay for your contact, OK. So what we're trying to do is move to a world where people can see it and nobody can hide. We've had phone calls from data providers say, hey, we got this great data. Can we put it in your system? We're like, no. They're like, but hey, could you remove that transparency thing? Like, so can we give you like, something like a FICA score, but then have you not tell the consumer? We're like, no, that's the whole point. If you're, if you're afraid of the consumer seeing it, then you shouldn't be giving it to us. So I think the, the, the core issue here is transparency. Cool. Um, can I I'm, comment, Michael? Sure, absolutely. Please. <laughs> so, so how many how many of you have been to the Yahoo homepage? How many of you have noticed a really big ad? And how many have clicked the link that says "Add Choices" above that really big ad? Omar has. <laughs> I did. You did. So you can click that, and it'll actually show you the BT categories that we classify you in. But I think the straw poll is that sunlight. I don't think people care. I don't think the audience cares, clearly, because we're giving you a choice to opt out of those categories. But I think that it's not adopted. And so what I think the challenge is here that you've got a detailed disclaimer document, you've got an op option for choice, but we're not finding that consumers actually care. 
And, and I think that it, you know, although we're, we're all after self-regulation here, we're finding that it's a real challenge to get people to even engage in that kind of a feature, even when literally it's right there. Next time you go, there's a little icon called Add Choices, but we just don't see the usage. You know, yeah. it's there, and people are interested in it, but we're not seeing that anybody actually clicks on it. Can I add one more thing to that? So I, I think there's a big credibility issue. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Um, so I think there's a big credibility issue happening. So I think the more that brands can be transparent with their users, to, I think to your point, and be open about how things are happening versus kind of closed. And I think of a lot, I mean, for myself and for anybody that uses kind of a lot of kind of the social graph out there, uh, I think a lot of you guys are questioning how your data is being perceived and how it's being used. So I think the more that uh, brands can be transparent with their users, I think, uh, I think that's going to definitely kind of help move the needle. And Matt, so I'm going to follow up then that's on that. The question of user data and analytics, um, switch up the order a bit. You know, you've, you've called Badgeville. Uh, maybe for our audience, you could for, preface with a description of what Badgeville does. But you described it to me as a user, an engagement analytics company. Um, but at the same time, you've also resisted this uh, term, game mechanics. I think a lot of us have heard this um, bandied about in the last six months. Could you both explain what, what you mean when you call Badgeville an engagement analytics, how you guys are using user data and analytics to drive better experiences for, for customers, and also why um, you're skeptical of these uh, game mechanic type uh, um, strategies. Sure, so, so who, who's a social gamer in the room? Who uses show of hands? Not many. Um, they won't admit it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they actually know. Um, they really are. Uh, so, so what we provide, uh, Badgeville provides, and uh, we are a social loyalty and rewards platform to drive engagements on websites and mobile. And if you think about Probably the best way to describe, and obviously tonight's uh, panel is, and the subject is around kind of Facebook and how the, the explosion of Facebook. Um, th there's three things that Facebook uh, does, does really, really well. Um, uh, and how many of you, I guess one other quick question, how many of you actually check your Facebook wall every day? Okay. How do you check your Twitter or get your tweets on a, on a pretty frequent basis? Okay, so Facebook does three things really well. It's called the dopamine drip. So it's like, it's called like social crack, right? So that's the first thing. Um, then there's this thing called social context. And the, sec the, the third thing is uh, social competition. So Facebook knows exactly what you're doing at all times of the day. They know what you're clicking, how you're behaving. They know what your friends are doing. And the more that you do, the more they understand it. So what we provide, and hopefully this kind of all comes together, is <clears throat> we provide the same techniques using using social gaming techniques. You can actually incentivize and drive the user to behave so that you can actually drive and reach lift on your website. And just the kind of the last piece to this, what's happening in the world right now is brands, when a consumer, any of you, think of a brand, whether it's um, a musician that you follow or whether it's the New York Times or... Um, whether it's Yahoo Sports or whether it's um, any type of brand, Dos Equis, for instance, they have a great campaign. A lot of people are starting to think about, I'm going to go to Facebook's fan page first. And they think of, I'm not going to go to the website first. I'm going to go to Facebook. So Facebook knows exactly who that user is. They know when they come in. There's social competition. You can bring in your friends. We flip the model, and we think about how you can actually use those same techniques to actually drive brand and actually increase the lifetime value of a user. And on, on the bottom of all this is an engagement analytics platform that allows you to predict basically the predict the behavior as well as kind of influence um, how your users are going to behave and grow. So basically badges as engagement sensors in a sense? So, so the gamification component, we actually don't use gamification at all. Um, we think it's a very, very narrow term. Um, the whole thing around badges and trophies and points, that just kind of touches one particular layer. But I you're mean, called bad, badge. I know, badge. I know. You know, it's, it, and it's, you know, and kind of the whole, the whole scheme of things, it's, you know, you know, badges, you know, Foursquare is a big thing out there, so badges, and then, you know, obviously Farmville. Farmville knows exactly what you're doing, and they're presenting you, they're using predictive analytics to present you with ways so that you can buy more currency, so that you can do more things. So why shouldn't you do that on any website, or why shouldn't you do that in the mobile ecosystem? Great. 
Um, I forgot the, the, the question. I was going to say I'm going to unlock the question badge when I started to ask you a question. And you'll get it. It's, it's going to have your face on it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, moving, moving towards the, the, the scale, I think I read somewhere that Facebook's like buttons consumed some uh, absurd amount of uh, bandwidth every day. Um, I know, Scott, at, uh, at Yahoo, you're the home of, of uh, Hadoop, and you guys have said, uh, you were quoted as saying that platforms and cloud enable science at scale. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a time when uh, you, you scaled an algorithm and what the result was, um, particularly with, with regard to ringing the cash register. How, how does scaling an algorithm at Yahoo scale help uh, drive a monetization result for you guys? Yeah, I can talk about a couple examples there. Uh, one question here for the audience, sort of how many people here are, are in the sciences field or in computer science sort of technologists or uh, researchers? Okay, so pretty good. More than half of the room actually. I think what, what we have found over the years and, and one of the reasons we made those investments to, to really drive Hadoop as an open source project is that we needed cost effective infrastructure to do the computation. Um, Google certainly needs it, Facebook needs it, Yahoo needs it. The kind of scale that we have, the number of auctions happening on a real-time basis in, in the right media exchange, um, we, we handle billions of ad impressions a day. And I think somebody alluded earlier to the fact that those are all, a lot of those are, there's a real-time decisioning aspect to making the call on how to match supply and demand. So it's a really big challenge. It's actually um, that Yahoo attracted a lot of uh, top economics researchers because they've got a field they can do field studies, where as in traditional economics, you can't run a field study like that. You know, you can't study the NASDAQ and run a bucket test on the NASDAQ, or at least you're not supposed to, uh, <laughs> uh, to figure out which way you get more lift. Um, but we do that all the time. And so um, examples of algorithms, uh, I think there's a, there's a rich set of, of stuff published through Yahoo Research because we're very supportive of that. And so the kind of algorithms that we test are, are leading edge algorithms in microeconomics. Um, there's, a, there's a guy who runs our advertising research, Andre Broder, who started a field. There's now a journal of, of computational advertising. And so there are a lot of researchers at, at Yahoo. And what we give them is the ability to have that algorithm that, that they came up with, whether it was their grad school research or the new work that they're doing, and actually take it to production in a bucket test in a matter of days or weeks. So there's probably hundreds of examples you know, every day that, that Yahoo's taking to production and testing out to see, because every little bit helps. You know, a tenth of a percent is a big deal when you have that much, that much traffic and that much data. I also want to comment, um, you mentioned Peter Norvig uh, at Google, who's a, who's a senior search leader in research at Google. And I don't know if any of you have seen him talk. He does give a great talk on machine translation. Has anybody seen that one? Um, he, he, they, the point he makes there is that they, Google has, and, and so do anybody who does search, has access to this entire corpus of the web and all the search queries. And what they have shown at Google is that they can outperform all of the grammar research. All of the people doing language models and natural language parsing, and they have a whole section at Google devoted to doing that. But those guys have never beat the statistical guys that actually just operate on the data itself because they have so much data that they actually can do better than all of the natural language models, at least that have been invented to date. So I think that, that comment is true. It's in that field, though. It's in that area where you have a very close link between machine translation and the language used. I think that, you know, as any good theoretical, you, you've done a lot of theory as well, you know, the theoreticians always, you know, outperform the experimentalists eventually. You get enough data and, and then the, 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 the the prophecies will come back. Like we'll make a new prediction for what the new model's gonna be. And then the experimentalists will catch up and there's this back and forth that happens. Scott, can you give an example where where the revert where Peter Norvig's thesis was false? Yeah, where, I think where, we, where more data for modeling. Yeah, no, well we do a lot of modeling and it, it ties back here to what um, some of the stuff Omar's talked about. We don't have perfect information on what your intent is. So we do a lot of modeling to try to derive intent or to make a prediction on the basis of what we've seen and what you've said. Um, and that's all part of the part of ad delivery. It's the there's actually a, a box in right media called predict, and its entire job is to predict on the basis of limited information, incomplete data, what we think the, the winning ad should be for that particular transaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm going to now get to, to Omar, the question that you were looking to get earlier, um, talking a bit about ecosystems and exchanges. 
Um, I guess, you know, I'm curious, you, you talked in your, your slides about how do you value, um, how do you value data? I'm curious how, what are some of the approaches that you guys have used at BlueKai Blue for valuing data inside your ecosystem? Um, and the second question related would be, um, uh, what do you think about uh, open exchanges uh, and open data? So sort of two and one, un unrelated. Um, can you clarify the second question? For sure. So, so I guess the idea being that um, when data has value, um, you wonder whether or not it should be public domain. Um, and what's, what types of data out there um, maybe ought to be in the public domain versus um, under control of, of a given company? Good question. Really good one. Let me start with the first. Um, when you talk about data value, it is, this is why we started the company. Um, I had run an ad business before this, a uh, company um, now called Audience Science. It's in behavioral targeting, a uh, good set of folks. And what we had noticed was certain data was really, really effective, right? Really effective. And it was when, when you get consumer intent. Mm -hmm. And certain other data was just kind of noisy. You know, someone read an article that had the word car in it, didn't mean they were going to buy a car. Um, and you couldn't incent the people who had the really valuable data to give it up because the business model was really ugly. Here's, here's the conversation it, it used to sound like before we came in. You go up to someone like the CEO of Amazon or eBay or Expedia and say, look, I'm ad network, you know, number, uh, I'm the biggest ad network on the planet. There are 400 ad networks, top 40 all say they're the biggest of something. So give me all your data in real time. Give me all of it and I'll put it in my magic algorithm box and if it generates some money, I'll give you a portion, but wait, I have so much data because I'm so big from other people that I may have to pay them first and you get a certain, by the end of the conversation you're like, oh my God, you're kidding me. I'm gonna give you my gold and you're, you're gonna, you're gonna you know, pay me back pennies? No way. And so first model we experimented with is you don't get the data till you pay for it. Um, and it turns out that that's almost exactly right that, like the CPM model. If you go to the Wall Street Journal and say, I'm not gonna pay you until the person sees the ad at the Wall Street Journal, they come to IBM and buy a computer uh, old thinking, um, <laughs> um, but you, you know, when, when you would buy a, a computer from them. But in any case, you'd go to them, you'd, you'd buy a computer, and then, and then they'd get paid. Um, that model, the Wall Street Journal will never do. They're, they're basically like, no, to show an ad in the Wall Street Journal, you have to pay me. That's CPM. There was no equivalent CPM for data. We invented one. We called it cost per stamp. And all of a sudden, that insulted a huge amount of data flowing in for people who had valuable data. So that was the first uh, thing. The model we never did, which is the model that other people do, is the rev share model, which says, hand me all your data, I'll put it in my magic box. And the reason we don't do that is there's like five versions of theft that occur when you give them their data. One, they do negative targeting, right? In other words, they can target females and you gave them the male attribute, you don't get paid for it because they didn't use your attribute. <laughs> or you, you, they mix in much, much worse data from someone else that they got in a bulk free deal and then they, they do a rev share between the both of you. There's like so many variants of this. So we, we never really wanted to go that route. The, so the first model was you don't get the data until you get paid for it, and that really made us grow and, and different. The second model we started to do is say, okay, we'll let you pay us when you use it, but the market sets the price and you don't. Um, I don't want to get into details. It gets a bit geeky because there are bid curves and, and, and so on. But the point is data is a non-rival good, meaning I can give it out multiple times. So it's very tricky to determine. You could give it out infinitely, give it out once, like a park, if I let one person in, they love the park. If I let 10 people in, they all love the park. If I let a million people in, you hate each other. And so it, data's, data's like that. You have to figure out ways that, um, uh, that there's an advantage to being the few who get it, um, and, and you have to control it. The second question on, on open data. Yeah, absolutely. There are many types of data that, 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 would be, uh, that should be in the open domain. Um, I think there are some very interesting companies out there, unfortunately I forget their names, who are in this business of aggregating a lot of open domain data and giving you platforms uh, to use it. Um, Fact, uh, I think Factual is one. Factual, exactly. Uh, good, good, good group of folks, um, ex-founders of the, the, what became AdSense actually, so interesting company. Um, uh, we're not in, in that space because our whole idea is you generate gold as a business and you want to turn that into money. Um, so we're not in the business of giving any of it out for free. So uh, I guess we're, one, one question I think might be relevant for the audience is many folks here obviously have an interest in predictive analytics. Um, each of you are involved in companies where predictive analytics plays a role. I, I guess we'll start at the, the end here. And Matt, um, Teresa, Scott, and, and Omar, I'd love to just quickly hear from you what skill sets you believe are, are most necessary for someone in the audience here that's thinking about getting um, more engaged in this field. 
So uh, speaking about some of your employees or folks that are most involved in predictive analytics, what, what could someone uh, look to learn? What's their background? So, so I'll think I'll, I'm, I'll try and answer it in, in a way that uh, is hopefully helpful. So in, in, the, in the world that we actually are in, there are two types of analytics that we see. Um, the one piece of analytics is page view analytics. You know, uh, Omniture, Google has done it. You can understand different ways uh, to uh, run of site analysis, entry, exit pages, um, you know, how deep somebody is going, what is their time spent on site. Um, so I think if you come from that particular realm and you're used to, and you're trying to understand how, um, how users, um, how, um, how your site is being perceived, that's the only way that brands can actually understand. So if you come from that world and you understand that world, um, that, that might be a good place to start. Where this, where this world is going and where we believe it's going is in the area of engagement analytics. Getting in the mind of the user, being able to predict what the user is going to do based on the behaviors that you want to get out of that particular user and being able to analyze that data and, and then kind of mold and be agile and, and kind of piecemeal everything together, um, there is no particular solution to the puzzle. It's a living, breathing type of thing. So if you come from kind of the traditional uh, page view world where you've, you're used to running through sites and you want to move into uh, a place where you can understand how users are engaging, what you can do to engage them more, how you can monetize that user, um, then I think that would be a, a place where you could um, really sink your teeth into, into our business. And I'm going to quote Omar here, quantitative hires are the hot hires at agencies which increasingly need data jocks uh, who can better understand consumer audiences. So, Teresia, uh, what, what do you see both, I guess, from companies, portfolio companies as well as um, new entrepreneurs that come to you guys? So, you know, what I would say is that I think that um, certainly people want, uh, in this area, you certainly want people with strong quantitative skills. I guess what I would say, though, is that especially at the founder level and especially when you're thinking about creating a whole new business, um, you really want people who, on the one hand, are very analytical and understand the algorithms and the techniques to scale, but you want someone who is creative and sees things in a very different manner than other people. Um, I was just in with a company that was doing some interesting things around predictive analytics to do financial services online, um, because now there's a lot more information that you can get in real time about a user than frankly Visa, MasterCard, or any of the banks ever had before. So there's some really interesting companies, um, some that we're involved with, like Wanga and others who are using very interesting techniques to better predict who will actually pay back small loans. Um, and, and what the guy said, and he actually came from one of the big credit card companies initially, he said, you know, he said, the most dangerous thing in the world is a competent statistician. <laughs> because he said, I had thousands of them, and they will find you things which are pretty good, and you won't, like, lose your shirt, but you won't create a great business. So what you actually want is the guy who is, you know, the sort of the... The incompetent. <laughs> well, no, you, you, want, you, you want the guy who's actually doesn't think of himself as a statistician, but thinks of himself a little bit as sort of, you know a data artiste, right, who kind of looks at the data and sees stuff that nobody else saw before. And that is certainly true in no matter whether it's a, a business that's trying to monetize audience engagement or ad data or whatever else, that's a common thread in at, or financial services company. All of the companies that we've worked with, whether they were ad exchanges or and yield optimization or financial services, new credit decisioning data, right? Mm -hmm. That is a common theme in the quantitative technical founder at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to throw out one other random thing, though, uh, along, um, uh, along the concept of, you know, data that's valuable. There's been a lot of talk on this panel about sort of intent and intent data, and I know, Scott, you get to go next, so you're going to rip this apart. Um, <laughs> we're, we're obviously also investors in a bunch of social media companies like Facebook and others. Um, 
And I actually think that something that's really interesting that we've observed, you know, there's a lot of question of like, mm -hmm. is there or is there not value in the social graph data? Is there or is there not value in the like information? And um, if you look at it from a traditional standpoint, I would say, in terms of intent and purchase intent and lift from that perspective, the answer is no, it's gonna seem like a very weak signal compared to you know, search data or data on retargeting that knows that you were actually doing research on something. But realize there's two types of transactions, right? There are those that are researched and no doubt that search and deep vertical content is amazing as a predictor for that. And then there are purchases which, I'll use the nice word, that are based on serendipity, or you might say impulse, or you might say stuff you didn't know you needed. Um, <laughs> and, 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 if you, you know, and it's if you go into the store, right, it's like the difference between buying milk versus like the gum at the end cap, right? And so we're also involved in companies like Groupon, right, and some other social shopping companies, be it Etsy or ModCloth or others. And I will tell you, those companies have identified that the mm. data that they can get and the targeting that they can do in some pretty different and orthogonal ways on Facebook or Twitter is actually more successful for them than some of the search data. And I'll start with the last one, which is, you know, it's an MIT company, so Dropbox. I don't know if any of you guys ever heard Drew talk about the fact that, like, he started the company and he tried to do, you know, some SEM campaigns, and it's like, dude, nobody's doing a search for, like, driving the sky, sharing files in the sky. It went nowhere, right? And so I, I think there are certain services, certain products, which um, will find a place and therefore there's an interesting opportunity for massive amounts of new data that maybe is perceived to be less valuable right now. Um, but I think it can be as valuable, if not more valuable, in the hands of the right creative artiste, but also targeted at the appropriate problem. Not the problems that you know a lot of other people are already working on, which are big, valuable problems. I'm not saying they're not, but they're different. So, okay, Omar, so quick response, and then we're gonna roll through, and then I'm gonna open up to the audience who's been waiting patiently for some questions. Without yeah. challenging the, the value of the social data, I mean, Groupon's awesome. Um, uh, what I will say is what people are underestimating is if, if we're connected on Facebook, and he says he likes a particular hotel. If I know that he said that, I might like it, and I might go there. So part of the social graph is the knowledge of who's on the other end of that link. There's another use of the data, which is to show me a hotel ad that he liked without letting me know that he liked it. I think the jury's out on that, and I'm not going to say anything. But for sure, the social graph data that connects us and lets me know who's behind it, that's gold. You'd, you'd go to a hotel I pick? Maybe the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I actually, th I think the... Uh, check the influencer here. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I, I think like and a lot of the kind of the Facebook functionality that's across many, many different sites, it's a Trojan horse. And, and honestly, it's a way to kind of insert, insert social behavior so that, so that the likes of Facebook, which I use Facebook, everybody here is guilty of it, they can understand, and it's a Trojan horse to get that data. And a lot of these brands think, oh, they're going to generate all this traffic back to me, but at the end of the day, they're actually getting that data and they're monetizing against it. Right. So actually, I, I am, I'm going to hop and not give you guys a chance to talk about your, uh, the skills for predictive analytics. I want to talk about Groupon being like, <laughs> the, like the gum on the end cap. So, so what, I, what I am going to do, you know, the I'm National Enquirer is on the end cap, you know, the the cap too. $6 billion pack of gum. Hey, you know, so, it's a... <laughs> So the first question, <laughs> the first question is going to go to Scott <laughs> because he's been he's been waiting to talk about some some other things and you can you can segue into whatever you like after you answer the question. So, um, <laughs> so that seems to be a, 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 a very easy way to go. Um, so uh, open up to the audience. Uh, who would like to ask a question of Scott? And I will repeat um, back the the question so the rest of us can hear it. Uh, so anyone bold enough to uh, over here? You will see a lift, you know, at the very beginning because because obviously, you know, you're going from zero to something. But how do you know that the lift is going to be sustainable going forward? Because what is the guarantee that all the gains that are to be had, you know, are, are you know, because the, the the medium is not saturated. So once it gets saturated, 
right, you're not going to get the lift that you got before. So I'm going to just repeat, repeat the question, which is how do you know when you gain lift from analytics that it's a sustainable lift? Mm. Time. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll add on to that. Um, I think what Teresa said is we've looked at Lyft on pretty much everything. And I think the social data, the social graph actually gives you Lyft on personalization. Because if I, you know, think about, you use Yahoo Mail. If I send mail to, you know, Matt and Teresa and Omar a couple times, Yahoo Mail ought to say, you know what, maybe there's a group here that you belong to that you want to talk to these topics about. And it should actually facilitate that for me. It should personalize my experience and make it better. So I think that's an example where the social signal, it's, it's sort of weak from a perspective of an advertiser, but it's strong from a perspective of personal connections and social mm -hmm. behavior. When you, when you want a signal to help an advertiser sell, unless it's the gum on the end cap, um, you, want, you want intent data. You want search queries. You want hard data about what somebody wants to buy, what brands they're associated with. Not clear. Maybe the, we'll see. The jury's out on whether if you like a brand, that somehow gives you, there's probably some connection there for, for brand advertising. Um, but I think what, what you pointed out is totally true. There, there's so much novelty effect that, that you honestly have to let these experiments run. Because something really, really bad also gets a novelty effect, and, and clicks go up, at least initially. Yeah, I was just going to add to it. I, I think it's about controlling the approach, and it's about actually not just opening up the floodgates, but it's like a crawl before you walk, before you run, before you sprint approach. So take a little snippet. You know, what we do is we, we actually kind of, uh, do, we have a, a really cool algorithm that we use to understand three different types of users, low, medium, and high users. Transient users, low users that come in through like Google or Yahoo, medium users, and high users. And how can you actually use um, data, amass data, to actually influence those low and medium users up the social engagement ladder to behave more. So if you open up the floodgates and use and you basically roll out everything at one time, you're you're probably going to get a response or your audience is going to turn off. So it's all about kind of controlling and phasing it out, looking at the data, kind of rejiggering it, going back to your original, you know, business objective and then kind of redo 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 circle circle circle. Okay. So you do need a statistician for that. <laughs> A competent status. Patience. <laughs> so we're going to do, a, a, I'm going to try a, a, an experiment here and do some rapid fire questions uh, and, and direct it to the panelists and we'll give you guys a one minute, see if you can keep your responses to one minute or less for anyone who's got questions out there. And we'll just go through, we've got about eight minutes left. So uh, you, sir, are here. was about how predictive analytics could work, particularly in the model of push advertising. And there's a big shift now to pull advertising that Groupon seems to be capitalizing on. So I'm curious, how are you shifting predictive analytics as a framework, particularly as pull is becoming much more dominant from the consumer perspective? Okay, so who wants to take that in uh, one minute or less uh, answer? Omar, I think I might have to volunteer you or Scott. Or I thought Teresa made the <laughs> <laughs> All right, Teresa. <laughs> I think we'll give Teresa one minute. Um, can I just say time? No. <laughs> uh, I think that the way you're using it for pull as opposed to push is two things. One is the signals that people are looking at are different. And I think that it is much more of a experimentation. So it's more. Um, it is truly more deterministic. So in the Groupon model specifically and most of the others that are using it, they will um, aggregate lots of data and run multiple tests, maybe thousands of different tests in a day in order to see what message, what creative, and what offer um, speaks to people. So in that sense, I'm agreeing completely with Scott. What it's very good for is it's, it's basically mass testing of different personalization. So fine segmentation that almost looks like personalization, you can imagine that might be where people will want to go eventually. Okay, right here, a question. Yes, yeah, so just probably absolutely a nonsense question, but how do you validate your algorithm? 
prediction algorithm. I want to put that to, to Omar because I'm curious, Omar, how do you validate your predictions that everyone seems to be an auto intender or a travel intender? Yeah, Omar, how do you yeah, do yeah, this, Omar? It's, it, so we have a couple ways. One, sometimes we work with a marketer and put a conversion pixel up on their page. And we're not allowed to share that data, but it allows us to judge the quality of the data. And so what we've done is we've shown graphs on uh, very non-intuitive. So for instance, someone goes to, we have 18 different auto comparison engines, right? And they have 5x the difference in conversion quality at the end of the day. And sometimes it's not the site with the biggest brand data that has the best conversion quality. It's a site that's with a, ver a name that's not known, fed by search. Um, so it's hard to predict. So what we do is we essentially let the data tell us by looking at the conversions the other end. The other signal that we get over the long term is the price of the data itself. So people go in and they bid for what we call interest data, meaning you read a few articles about cars. And the prices of that are about 6x less than the prices of intent data, someone who's now searching for a car. And then if you go one level deeper and you look at someone who's looking for a particular model of luxury car, that price in the marketplace is higher. So we, it's essentially pricing is collective wisdom of all the bidders, telling you really what the data's worth, and the price is an encapsulation of that signal. Okay, next question right here. You mentioned that all advertising will be data driven pretty soon. Right. What is your view on like video advertising, right? especially TV ads? Big, yeah, yeah. Fa fa <laughs> fantastic question. So we've been looking at, in Q4, I was looking at the sources of people buying in our exchange, and one of the fastest growing segments was video advertising online. So it's already heading in that direction. Um, the key issue, you'll be surprised, is one of how do I put my budget to work? I mean, think of the billions they put on TV, and you come to them and say, I can give you a fantastic segment. Fantastic. And you know, we're a company and we're starting up with, I can give you two million worth of data. And the guy's probably thinking to himself, I need to put 200 million to work, right? So you have this issue where there's more dollars that they put in this inefficient medium and you're almost too efficient. And so as we get, as we get better and, and, and apply our reach to different medium, we're, our curve in terms of how much reach we can affect with our data is gonna grow. And, and you'll see a lot of that, that money shift. I think you said that video, uh, video and data are like peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> is your quote somewhere. Uh, question here. So we're talking about uh, data when, when you already have it, but we're also talking about a lot of uh, niche media areas. Uh, what planning tools do each of you suggest? And you can just say the brand. You don't need to go into sentences and paragraphs. I mean, there's Quantcast that's free. There's, you know, Google Planner. Say I wanted to plan, and I'm not, I don't have a data platform yet. My client does not have a data management system yet. I, I think I'm going to have Teresa, oh, Teresa answer that because I feel like you're the only one who doesn't have a com you're not working for a company whose product could be used <laughs> for planning. So, what, and you're in, across your portfolio. Wait a second, did so I just hear the, the VC is the most neutral party on the board? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not we're biased. Switzerland. The premise. We're Switzerland. Switzerland. So the, you know what, frankly, I don't care if you're neutral or not. Just give the so the question was, what sorts of planning tools are people using to evaluate some of the, the analytics out there? And what do you see your, company, your portfolio companies using outside of the th three guys here? So... The honest answer is to start with, most people use free tools. Mm -hmm. So most people use some combination of Google Analytics to see what's really happening on their site and, you know, Quantcast or Compete or various different third-party tools. So anything new and upcoming? Haven't seen anything new since Quantcast, which I'm not sure if that's really an analytics tool or an ad network. So yeah, yeah. Take, we're going to take two more questions. So the final two questions. If you raise, the, the person who raises their hand the highest <laughs> to, be, to be a way of predictive, anal, predictive analytics over the value, the value of your question. So you, sir, got out of your seat. Very good. Um, I guess my question is more towards the old axiom of uh, uh, actions are worth, worth more than words. So is someone's activity, what they're doing online, the data off of that, is that worth more than what they're searching for? Like if they just type in something, I want to search this, but they're over here playing poker, which one, you know, what they've been doing for five hours versus what they ask in two seconds. So the question was, do, uh, what are, what's more important, uh, how, what people are doing on the, on the Internet in terms of their 
actions or what they search for. Um, Scott's the only one who actually has both of those. Yeah, so Scott, That's I think true. this is your chance to segue into something completely different. <laughs> Besides time. I'll try to answer In it. In one minute or less. No, I would just say I, there's a funny anecdote about the Yahoo homepage, which is the we personalize that top story module, um, but we actually have to have humans in the loop on that because if we didn't put human editorial in the loop on that, um, you can you would actually expect to see a lot of Britney Spears on the homepage, <laughs> and it's because all of you click on those stories. And so what happens is we automatically personalize and we actually have to keep an editorial voice because exactly like you say, everybody says, I don't click on those stories. But go back home and actually look at what story it puts up for you. It's my daughter's. It's your daughter's. It's his daughter's browser, yeah. But <laughs> keep telling yourself that. <laughs> There's some reason that, you know, you're seeing that. Um, but it's true, that's a fully personalized module, and everybody here will see a different set of stories during the day, but it is exactly that. The actions are what, what really dictates what you're interested in as opposed to what you tell us in the surveys. No wonder why only two people uh, held up their hands around social gaming. Shame on you. <laughs> Sorry, Freakonomics. So the last question, I think uh, we had a gentleman here who almost got out of his seat in the back there. Um, so how, do you guys, how do you determine data exhaustion? So like Omar's example of the park, how do you actually determine that a piece of data is no longer used because it's been given out too much? So how do you determine when a piece of data is exhausted and it no longer has any remaining value? Fantastic question. Okay, um, we'll give Omar that question. <laughs> fantastic question. So the, the first thing is that we have a bid decay curve. We do not give it out infinitely. So for instance, if you're bid rank number one, you get 100% of the people you wanted. So if there were 100 Hawaii travelers, you bid rank number, you get one of them. If you're bid rank number 10, you might get five of them. So we, 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 we create enforced scarcity to make sure it doesn't give out too much. And we design our bid rank curve to, to that effect. The other way to do it is to use um, what we call Paris Metro pricing. Paris Metro pricing is a, a way of looking at um, uh, the price of a ticket in the Paris Metro where the first class ticket is twice the cost of, of the second class ticket even though it's the same cart. Because by charging twice as much, fewer people end up using it. And so you use pricing as a way to make sure that something is less exhausted. So there are many techniques. Those are a couple that we use. Although I'll just add one thing. I don't think there's ever an end value to data. I think it's all about how you can amass that data, reassemble that data, compare that data. I mean, one of the cool things is what if you could, like, uh, choose particular elements of data and be able to actually, in six months from now, compare to what you're doing in, with that data or with, with the elements that you're trying to drive against others that are doing the same thing and see how you're doing. So it's all about amassing that data and using that data and kind of reusing it over and over and over again.